I, I never met anybody who says, my goal in life is I want to complain more. Nobody thinks about that as being a spiritual gift, and yet we actually live at what one author I read calls the culture of complaint. Thumb sucking, whine, whine, whine. And nobody likes to be around you. And you're going to find out God doesn't like it either. Now, there are basically two ways to quit complaining, Jim. One, <laughs> I'm only picking on him because he's one of the older members here. One, one of them is to change your external world. So there's no circumstance to complain about. Wouldn't that be great? That means if you've been complaining about not being married, you got to go get married. If you're married, you have to improve your spouse into the kind of a person that would never generate grounds for complaint. You have to have one of those jobs where your boss asks you, what hours would you like to work, sweetheart? How much money would you like to make? You have to make sure Highway 281 and 1604 are always traffic free. You have to make sure your dates are cute. Your grades are A's, and all your relatives are in therapy. That's, that's one way to try to quit complaining. Change your external world. And how's that working for you? Huh? The other way is change your internal world. You know, ask God if you're a believer. God, would you give me the kind of inner attitude so I could receive every day of life above ground on planet Earth like it's manna from you? Because it is. In fact, David said, God... Teach me to number my days, not years. Every day is precious. When I wake up, thank God I'm awake, I'm alive on planet Earth. That's a good thing. Could, could you, Lord, show me what the apostle talked about when Paul says, learning the secret to being content in every situation? You might not be happy, but I can be content in it. And here's the thing. We still live in this broken world where pain and difficult things happen to us all the time. We don't want to be just syrupy or inauthentic. So how do we go about pursuing, quitting, stopping, complaining? Now, there's actually a distinction between two key words in the Bible, and they both start with the letter G. They're both things people do in the Bible when bad things happen to them. One of them is the word groan. G-R-O-A-N, groan. goes all the way back in the history of Israel. We're told this, moreover, this is God talking to Moses, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. That's in Exodus chapter 6. Exodus 2, verse 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and He remembered His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, the practice of groaning, whatever it might be, we'll see in a little bit, is so important, it got included in sacred literature like the Psalms. Here's what the psalmist said, Psalm 6. Verse 3, my soul is in deep anguish. How long, O oh Lord, how long? I'm worn out from my groaning. Some of you could fit into that one right now. Huh? The psalmist is actually experiencing groaning fatigue. In fact, groaning is actually commanded in the Bible. There's a book called Lamentations. I know it's not on your best reader. It's not on Oprah's book club, but it's called Lamentations. It's not a book read very much at weddings. But the writer of Lamentations in chapter 2, I think it's verse 19, says, Arise, groan in the night. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Look, Lord, and consider, whom have you ever treated like this? You ever want to pray that? Reminds me of the Scotsman who was praying one day, and he said, Lord, I'm not surprised you got as few friends as you do the way you treat the ones you got. Come on, you felt like that at least. That's groaning. People do that in the Bible and in real life, and it's actually commanded in Scripture. Then there's another word starting with the letter G. It's the word grumbling. Grum Maybe you're sitting next to grumbling. Sometimes people grumble, and you see it way back in Israel again. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? Moses reminds them about this part in their history. He says, you grumbled in your tents and you said the Lord hates us. The word also makes it into the Psalms. 
Here's what David said. They grumbled in their tents and did not obey the Lord. Now, that word grumbling is actually prohibited in the Bible. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Philippi, and he said in Philippians chapter 2, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Wouldn't that be nice? Anybody here ever grumble? You, you might think grumbling sounds pretty petty, but in the Bible you'd be wrong. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and he said, we ought to avoid the sins Israel committed while they wandered in the wilderness. There were lots of them. He mentioned some, and he says that we shouldn't commit idolatry or sexual immorality or defy God. Then he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Well, hello. I'd hate to have that visitation in the night hours in my bedroom. How about you? All people talk about, well, the angel appeared to me. Well, this is one I don't want to appear to me, the destroying angel, right? And so you got these two words, groaning and grumbling. Groaning is actually encouraged in the Bible, but grumbling is forbidden. So what's the difference between them? Groaning is something I do to God. Grumbling is something I say about God. Groaning I do to God's face. Grumbling is what I do behind his back. So the place where Israel would groan is on their knees in prayer to God, just telling him exactly how they felt. That was okay. The place where they would grumble is in their tents in isolations where they're free to exaggerate or make up whatever they wanted to about what they were not happy about. Grumbling can be so destructive. When there's a problem, we want to talk to each other but not about each other, which is at the heart of grumbling. See, so what I want to do in this few minutes that are left is talk about the anatomy of grumbling. I want to walk through a time in the history of Israel when they had a big problem grumbling and see why it's so destructive and let you and I do a little bit of self-examination about it and then talk about how we get liberated from it. Because I think for us to be a church that's known for gratitude, to be a place where we're actually liberated from complaining, and to be a place where when people come, they know they're going to experience thanksgiving unto God, that's a powerful thing. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for a lot of things. I'm, I'm grateful looking back in my life, I'm grateful for things God didn't do to me, that God prohibited from happening to me that could have. And that goes for everybody in this room. Probably, if you're over 20. Well, way back in Israel's history, God delivers them from slavery. He literally parts the Red Sea. You don't see that every day. He sends 10 plagues on Egypt. He destroys Pharaoh's army. And the very first hymn sung in praise to God, and they're on their way to the promised land. Why, you think they'd be grateful as long as they live after that? Well, not so much. So, they can't find water. So the people grumbled against Moses, must be Moses' fault, saying, what are we going to drink? And God miraculously supplies sweet water for them, so they have freedom and water. Now we think, well, now they're going to be grateful forever. Not so much. It says the whole nation of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Why didn't God let us die in comfort in Egypt? If I'd have been Moses, I'd said, I wish he had. <laughs> Where we had lamb stew. Remember that wonderful lamb stew. You brought us out into this wilderness to starve us to death. Well, God hears their grumbling. And again, he's gracious. And he miraculously provides bread from heaven. It's gluten-free. It's organic. This is incredible. The Israelites named it manna. The word manna means, what is it? Or out on the street, what it is? <laughs> Nobody knows. It tasted like a cracker with honey. Pretty delicious. So it's pretty good stuff, non-fattening. And you think, well, they'll be grateful to God forever now. Not so much. God's given them freedom. God's given them water. God's given them bread, miraculously. And it says, the people fell to grumbling over their hard life. They got tired of manna. And God heard, and when he heard, his anger flared. 
The riffraff among the people of Israel had a craving, and soon they had all the people of Israel whining and complaining. Why can't we have meat? You know, we ate fish in Egypt and got it for free, Numbers chapter 11. Remember that word, we got it free. I'm coming back to that one. We got it free. We ate fish in Egypt and got it free to say nothing of cucumbers, melons, leeks, and onions, and garlic. But nothing tastes good out here. All we get is manna, manna, manna. Anybody hear a little grumbling going on? Now we start to see part of what's so destructive about grumbling and why God takes it so seriously and how it can destroy a soul and our joy in life. For one thing, it's incredibly contagious. The riffraff among us, the lower level of folks, just a few of these grouchy old people started it. They had a craving, and soon they had all the people of Israel complaining, grumbling. So it started with the riffraff, then it started spreading like cancer. Grumbling is that way. Emotions are unbelievably contagious. They're about the most contagious thing in the world, much more than COVID-19. There was a fascinating study done just a couple of years ago. Researchers would take two people, have them sit in a chair facing each other for five minutes, not say a word, and then walk out of the room. What they discovered is that one person was depressed And at the end of those five minutes, the other person was significantly more depressed than they had been before they came and sat in that chair, just from sitting in the presence of somebody depressed. Just to be sitting next to a negative person will make you more negative. Now that you know that, how many of you would like to get up and move seats right now? (laughs) It's an incredibly contagious thing. Pretty soon, everybody's whining. See, the reason I grumble is it reinforces my sense of superiority. When I'm grumbling about something else, I don't have to look at myself. I don't have to be responsible for myself. I don't have to look at my problems. Grumbling is incredibly toxic. It can destroy a family, an office, a business. It can mess up a church. Grumbling is destructive because it's incredibly contagious and toxic. I'll tell you what else it does. It distorts your perspective. That's another aspect of grumbling. See, what they're grumbling about here is, why can't we have meat? They're they're talking about what's on the menu. They they think they're going to Aldino's or J Prime or something. They say, remember in Egypt, we had fish for free. Hey, Sparky, they didn't have it for free. Does anybody remember where they were and what they were doing in Egypt when they said it? They were slaves for crying out loud. But when they're grumbling, they sort of forgot about that. Man, we had it so good back then. You've lost your mind. See, when I'm grumbling, it causes me to blow past or ignore or dismiss all of the good things God's done for me and exaggerate what happens to be difficult in my life at the moment. Which is why gratitude ought to be something we practice every day on your way to work, no matter what you're facing. Take a few moments to tell God Thank you, you didn't kill me. Thank you, you forgave me. Thank you, I have food to eat. Thank you, I have clothes to put on. Or I had a car to get here. I didn't have to ride via. I have a thank you for a few friends who love me, warts and all. There's a lot to be thankful for. I've got a refrigerator, not an ice box. I lived in the 40s when we had an ice man come in a white truck, a white outfit, looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. He had these big tongs, and he would bring a block of ice and put it in the ice box. Anybody remember that? <laughs> Jim, I know you remember. <laughs> in fact, I think you delivered our first meal. Our first <laughs> I, I, okay, confession time. I, I remember once on a flight losing my iPhone. And I was grumbling about it. People are passing me, getting off the plane at the airport, and I'm looking everywhere. The flight attendant came up and said, sir, it's probably in your bag. I said, look, I'm not stupid. I've looked all through my bag. I'm on the floor. I went into the restroom because I remember going in there. Maybe I left it in the toilet. It wasn't there. I came back to my seat. Then I thought, I bet the guy sitting next to me. I remember I had it on the armrest and fell asleep, and he didn't look like a very trustworthy guy. I bet he took my phone. 
The flight attendant again said to me, sir, 90% of the time, the phone is in somebody's bag. Well, I opened my bag just to show her I'm not stupid. It's not in the bag. And she pointed in my bag and said, sir, what is that phone-like object in your bag? <laughs> it was my phone. My prodigal phone had come home. Now, do you... <laughs> Do you think that made me happy? Do you think I'd kill the fatty calf because of that? No, I was upset that she was right and I'm wrong. <laughs> and here's the thing, I was thinking about this. Imagine that one of these grumbling Israelites we just read about from thousands of years ago could have been magically transported to me at that moment in the airport. And they would say to me, Rick, do you mean to tell me you got to fly back to Texas to a home, a wife, and kids you love? And the way you got there, the way you traveled, you got on this thing called an airplane. You sat in a seat for two and a half hours. You got to eat, drink, and sleep. And when you got off of it, you had flown like 2,000 miles like a bird. Then you had lost this amazing object that enables you to talk to anybody anywhere in the world and write anybody anywhere, anytime in the world and look up information that didn't even exist when we were around. And you're grumbling because a total stranger was kind enough to help you find it when it was lost. That'll humble you. I sometimes think if there's one verse that's not in the Bible that ought to be, it'd be, suck it up, saith the Lord. <laughs> Shut up complaining. Here's the thing. When I groan, I do it in the presence of God to God. Groaning in the Bible is God-centered. It's just me one-on-one -on -one with God. It comes on people who are in deep pain or deep sorrow. Grumbling is self-centered. It's all about me, what I want. How come I'm not having the fish I want or the meat I want or my pleasure or my success? It, it's all kinds of self junked up in there, and it's destructive to the soul. And brother, is it contagious, even among your children. It, it, it happens. Now look what happens. It starts with the riffraff, then it goes to the whole people of Israel. Now look at this. This is the leader. Grumbling can kill a leader. Numbers 11, verse 11 through 14. Moses heard their whining. All the families were whining in front of their tents, and God's anger blazed up. Moses saw that things were in a bad way. Yeah, I think so. And Moses said to God, why are you treating me this way? What did I do to you to deserve this? Did I conceive them? Was I their mother? So why are you dumping all this responsibility of this people on me? Why tell me to carry them around like a nursing mother, carrying them all the way to the land you promised to their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people who are whining to me? Give us meat. Give us meat. We want meat. I can't do this by myself, Lord. It's too much. If this is how you intend to treat me, do me a favor and kill me. I've seen enough. I had enough. I'm out of here. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if you hadn't prayed that, you, you hadn't been around. But notice, he's talking mano mano, one on one to God, right to God's face. He's telling the Lord, and by the way, the Lord knows how you feel. It, it isn't like the Lord said, My goodness, Moses, why I had no idea. Of course he did. So that's not the most spiritual sounding passage in the Bible, is it? That's some pretty serious complaining against God. God, you're doing a bad job. I'm giving you a bad performance review. You're not getting a merit pay raise at all this time. And Moses just gets one thing right. He complains to God, not about God. So he's groaning. He goes to God's face, not behind God's back. And I have to tell you, reading through that, one of the convictions I came to is I need to do more groaning with God. Moses, his honesty with God, the edginess of his language with God, wasn't religious at all. There's nothing polite here. I think Moses must have had such a deep, authentic, real, honest kind of a, a life with God that he could talk very frankly to him. That's a good thing. Yeah. 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 He likes that. If you ever find your prayers kind of boring or dull, there's no life in them, that's because you hadn't got any reality in there. You need to just unload, be completely transparent with God. Oh, he loves that. See, God can work with groaning. God wants us to go through life without grumbling. So here's the thing. The idea of I quit complaining 
is not. I'm filled with just as much negativity, sourness, and pessimism, and ingratitude as ever, but I'll try to suppress it by an act of my will, and I'll just act, fake it till I make it, cheerier. No, no. God's will is that we actually be transformed so we learn, it's learned, to experience this moment, this day, this place where I am, being with Him as a gift from God, a gift of God's grace. God, I'm so thankful. Thank you. And I thank you that in this bad spot I'm in, you're with me. You never leave me. You never forsake me. Just as you were with Israel, I've heard their cry. You've heard, you hear my cry right now. I just want to tell you how I feel. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if the level of our gratitude at Summit achieved the level of our blessing? What a cool thing that would be. And one of them is we actually practice the expression of gratitude, whether or not we're experiencing, listen, the emotion. I remember visiting somebody part of our church for a long time, and she was in a bad physical condition, no hope at all for recovery at her age particularly and with what disease she had. And we talked a little bit, and I asked her, how are you doing? I'll never forget. She looked at me and she said, Rick, I've had a wonderful life. I'm surrounded by people I love. I have my family right here with me. The pain isn't bad. I know it might be, but the pain's not bad. I have so much to be grateful for. That's what she said. I have so much to be grateful for. And I have to tell you, we all need to grow into that. The place it starts really is just to express gratitude. Psalms 100 says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And I was thinking about that. That's an odd phrase. Make a joyful noise. Not very descriptive. Anybody can do that. It's not specific. A joyful noise. And part of what's interesting is that he doesn't say, have a joyful feeling. He says, make a joyful noise. Because I can do that. It's easier to actuate into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. In other words, I've done things I didn't feel like doing, and after I did them, then I got a feeling. See, if I wait on a feeling, I may never take the garbage out (laughs) or the dog out. Or I may next time just lose the dog. I don't know what happened. She just took off. I broke the leash. I have no idea what that dog is. (laughs) I love how Eugene Peterson translates Psalms 100, if you want to look it up. It's in the Message Bible. And this is how he translates it. On your feet now, applaud God. That's in our day, that's a joyful noise. Bring a gift of laughter. Some of you don't know you can laugh in church. Laughter doeth good like a medicine. People, some of you need to look in the mirror and have a good laugh. Yeah, it's a Bible thing. It's a beautiful gift. It's medicinal. When you come to church, when you gather with friends, bring a gift of laughter. He says, sing yourself into his presence. He didn't have to be on in tune, especially in a corporate setting like this. Have you ever noticed? I think I sound good till Nate stops singing on the microphone and leaves the congregation to sing, and I thought, I suck. That's, <laughs> Nate, sing. Yeah, I, I'm just being honest. That's why singing is such a good thing. It expresses the heart. He enter the presence of God with the password, thank you. Love Eugene's translation. I love that password. Anybody but me got lots of passwords? Yeah, you got them for your computer. Anybody ever grumble about passwords? <laughs> I hate this. I have so many passwords. You know, your, your bank account, security stuff, your phone, your iPad, getting into this one, getting into that. What's the, what's the code for that? And then if you, if you uh, get a checkup with a doctor, you've got to go in, get a password to get into your... And I, I'm thinking, dear God, I, it's like the CIA breaking this code. And I, don't, I just don't think about it. And then I have a whole file of my passwords that has a password to protect it. And I forgot the password to the file. So then I'm grumbling about that, and I have to call Joseph Gutierrez. Joseph, come unlock this thing. What's my password? I don't know. The password for going into God's presence is thank you. On your feet now, applaud God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. See? On your feet, applaud God. I was thinking how cool it would be to be part of a group that was so fired up about God's goodness 
not how you feel at the moment, how cool it would be for people who stop and think, you know what, when I woke up this morning, it wasn't a coincidence. God woke me up. God put me in the right mind. I got a table. I got food on it. I had clothes to put on. A lot of people in the world don't. And there's this fabulous planet I get to live on. Not just a great planet with sunrises, sunsets, trees, and birds, and uh, what's the fever we get here? Cedar fever. Yeah. <laughs> but I get to live in Texas, the best part of the great planet, Earth. Think about it. Not just that. I got a family. I have a church family. I have people who care about me. Then there's the Bible. I get to actually learn about who God actually is. And there's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in my life. I don't have to be alone ever. I have a spiritual gift I can use to make some difference in the world. Then best of all, God gave me Jesus, the master of life, whose teaching still changes the world, transforms heart, and whose life is a matchless piece of goodness and beauty. Then he died on the cross, and I have the forgiveness of my sins. Not one of them is ever counted against me by my God. Then Jesus rose from the dead. I have the resurrection at work in my life, in my body right now. Then I have heaven to look forward to. I don't have to worry about COVID killing me or dying because I'm going to be with God forever in heaven. What, wouldn't it be, that's a quick summary, but wouldn't it be cool to be with a group of people who are so excited about God when the Bible says, on your feet now, applaud God. They actually did it. Wouldn't that be a cool thing? You know, we applaud for the dumbest thing. Somebody hits a ball with a stick, we go crazy. Somebody runs a pigskin over, if it's Dallas, we all go crazy, but if they run a pigskin over the goal line, people go nuts. So here's the God of the universe every once in a while, just once in a while. At home, in your office, alone, or in church, somebody ought to jump up on their feet and say, oh God, what a great God you are. Hallelujah. That's the password. That's how I come into his, into, yeah, that's how I come in. Woo! That's how I come into his, hey, yeah, come on. Come on. Thank you, God. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. Thank you. So, Somebody get some EMS, some folks might have a little high blood pressure going on right now. I just think, God, what a good God you are. How grateful I am to be alive in your world. That's the password. Then I connect the dots and I'm aware God is right here in my mess. He's right here in my bad situation. He's right here in a bad diagnosis with a doctor. This tool is available wherever you are. Whatever you're doing, whatever's going on in your life, every day, every moment right now, we live in a culture, in a world that will keep trying to tell you, no, 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 Rick, grumble, 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 grumble. But God's not in the grumble. God's in the gratitude. And that's one vehicle, one tool you can use. Now, let me say a word, especially to everybody who might be really hurting, because that's going to be a fair number of people from our church and others in our city and nation and world. And if it's not you today, it probably will be someday. Then you'll groan. See, groaning is what you do when you hurt so much that words can't express it. We want to protect people we love from it, but we can't. When our granddaughter Mia was, I think, three years old, she broke her arm. See the picture up here? She had to go to the emergency room at the hospital. Now, she had never gone through that yet. I would never want her to. But I'll never forget holding that little body. Well, the doctor, the surgeon there at the ER came, and Adam, my son-in-law, her daddy, who's an orthopedic surgeon, basically told him to get out of the way, and he took over. And then there's this needle that looked huge to me with that little baby, and that needle went into her arm, and she groaned. Oh, that hurt me to watch. She let out a cry. Her eyes got really big, and she looked at us like, how could you do this to me? Every moment up to now, you've protected me from pain. Why, you've never hurt me. Why did you hurt me now? And Adam, her daddy and doctor, looked at her and said, Oh, sweetheart, this was mommy's idea. I would never do this to you. <laughs> see, see, groaning goes way deep. Creation groans. Things aren't the way they're supposed to be in this world since the fall of Adam. Death and sickness and pain, that wasn't God's idea. God didn't do that. It's all wrong. A happy attitude cannot wallpaper over that. See, those of us who know and love and seek to follow Jesus the best we can, who name the name of Jesus, who have been given the Holy Spirit, we're not exempt from groaning. 
See, this ought to be a place of great gratitude where we're just lavishly grateful to God, where we stand to our feet and applaud God. This ought to be a place where groaning is welcome, honest, and real. So many people get confused about it. They think if something bad happens and they're sad that they've done something wrong or God has done something wrong, or we're supposed to be part of this uh, fake religion bargain where as long as I follow Jesus and I obey Him the best I can, everything will come up roses. Not so much. Didn't Jesus say in this world you will have tribulation? Coming soon to a home near you. That's what He said, right? But He goes on. He says, we who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit groan inwardly. Not just that. Paul calls it a great mystery. Likewise, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. So the Spirit helps us in our weakness, not by making things okay or just making me tough. He says, for we know not what to pray as we ought. Sometimes I don't know what to pray. Now, if you're, if you're a Spirit-filled believer, you can use your prayer language. But I'll tell you something else. Whether you do or don't, you still have the Holy Spirit who loves you, who has sealed you, and He makes intercession with your pitiful words to the Father about what you should be praying and how you should. you got a helper there. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. See it? Creation groans. People groan. Christians groan. Who else groans? God groans. Do you understand our God, the holy, matchless, wonderful, powerful, joyful creator of everything is a groaning God? Only the God of the Bible is a groaning God. Only the God who Jesus made known to us is a groaning God. The most mysterious words Jesus ever spoke on the cross when he was in anguish, physical anguish, spiritual anguish, he groaned a cry that came to be known as the cry of their addiction. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Jesus. That's why Jesus understands what you're going through. He was tempted in every way like you and me, but without sin. I flubbed on that one. I've, I fumbled the ball on that one, but he didn't. So you can't ever say, God, you just don't understand. Really? He came through a birth canal just like you. He was spit on, rejected, cursed, smitten. Re I mean, he had it all, okay? He, he was called the devil, Beelzebub. Don't, don't say he doesn't know what you're going through. Don't ever say that. So in Jesus, God groans with me so that one day you can reign in love and power and joy with God. That's our God, a groaning God. That's why we stand up and applaud our God. There's no other God that can match him. He says he will be with you. He will give you through his son Jesus and his spirit of Jesus the power to live a life that transcends the kind of grumbling after stupid stuff that we all should want to quit. Next week, we're going to look at quitting the one thing that will make you more miserable than anything else. I can't tell you what that is. You'll have to come back for that. So don't grumble about it when you leave. Thank you for watching today's message. Subscribe today to be up to date on all of Pastor Rick's messages. And be sure to visit SummitSA.com for more information.